I can't take on your problems as my own, meaning I cannot, I cannot emotionally be vested to the point where I'm sacrificing my own well-being or my other responsibilities. They're not, those are not my problems to carry. I have my own problems to carry and you are not responsible for carrying mine. But if I can teach you or support you or encourage you along the way to learn how to pick up your own problems and make your back strong enough to carry them, that's my responsibility. But I'm not gonna own your problems. Kip, good to see you, man. Looks like you have a little bit more uh, gray hair in that beard after, what, a week in Disneyland? Yeah, pro probably, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Your beard looks longer. I don't know if it's more gray, but it certainly looks longer than it's yeah. been in a while. Well, whenever it gets longer, the, the more gray shows up, for sure. Yeah, it, yeah. It was great. Asia's mom had a, her 70th birthday, and so we uh, surprised her, all her kids, and most of her grandkids all like showed up at Disneyland, right? And so as you can uh, imagine, it's <laughs> not as simple as like just your family at Disneyland, like you're trying to coordinate, like let's all hit this ride and it's just chaos, you know? So maybe it, maybe sounds, there's some more gray because of it. That sounds, well, I don't know if you listened to last week's Ask Me Anything, but I was busting your tail about uh, being at Disneyland, like why any father would take his kids to Disneyland. And now I can see, okay, he's trying to do a good thing. I'll, I'll give it to you. I still don't approve of it, but you yeah, know, yeah. I'll give it to you. All right. Well, I'll, I'll adjust my life to, to, so it's in line with the approval of what Ryan Mickler thinks. So I, I'm working It's on, not I'm so much on. what I think. It's order of man. You know, it's, it's bigger oh, than me, it. Kip. It's order of man. All right. The whole movement <laughs> is shaming me. Yeah. That's right. It's not just me. It's everybody at this point. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right, man. Well, let's get into some headlines today. And then I think we've got some really good questions that we can uh, attempt to tackle as well. Absolutely. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I'll start. So I, <laughs> it's not a headline in particular, but it's just a couple of things that I saw over the weekend, uh, specifically as it relates to commercials and the way that some of these major corporations and companies market themselves. Mm. And I don't know why they haven't quite caught on yet, but the cultural landscape is changing. And for whatever reason, there is a handful of large organizations and companies that continue to pander to dying ideology and agendas that don't align with the majority of American principles. And we, and we have voted that way. So two yeah. come, come in, in, in particular, and I guess the first is Jaguar. They're not an American company, but Jaguar. Have you seen the new Jaguar commercial? I've, I've heard about it, and all I remember is thinking like, oh, another Bud Light decision is, is what crossed my mind. But I don't think I've actually seen the commercial. It looks like something directly out of a nightmarish version of Zoolander. I, <laughs> I can't describe it any other way. There's, not, there's no car in it, even. There, there's no car. Oh, really? It's just Zero a bunch of people dressed up. Yeah, it looks like, um, well, like Zoolander, but what's the, what's the other one? The um, Hunger Games. It, it looks like something from a, a Zoolander from and Hunger Games had a, had a child together. Yeah. And, and, and just vomited a rainbow all over the, all over the screen. I don't understand what the play is. And, and at some point, maybe they will. But when you start putting all of that transgender ideology and this just this nonsense and make it look like this spectacle, people don't align with that. And I don't understand why companies are so willingly uh, interested in demolishing their brand when they could just go sell cars or sell beer. So the other one that came to mind, and you already said it, was Bud Light. We know the whole thing about Dylan Mulvaney and the boycott of Bud Light, but I watched a commercial over the weekend and Bud Light is doing things a little better. I'll say it that way. Uh, yeah. and I actually thought it was a pretty clever commercial. Have you seen it? I haven't. Yeah. It, it's a pretty clever commercial. It's with, uh, gosh, I can't even think of the guy's name right now. I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. He's a, he's a well-known comedian. Uh, it, it's not somebody that I would consider woke or anything like that. And it's not really any sort of play on wokeism or anything like that, but it's a pretty interesting commercial. They did a good job on it. 
But where I got hung up was I thought the boycott of Bud Light was still on. And it should be. And then you see guys like Dana White and Donald Trump and Kid Rock throwing all of their weight and their social clout behind companies like Bud Light. And I cannot help but think, why? They screwed up. And unless we want to continue to change the culture, then we need to continue to hurt these companies by their, in their pocketbooks so we can actually hurt them where it counts so they can change. Now, some people say, well, yeah, see, Bud Light's changing. I don't care. You burn that bridge. It's not that I drink yeah. anyways, but you know what I mean? Like you've burned, you've burned that bridge. And I think that we need to do a better job maintaining the course when companies like this screw up, especially when you're alienating not just Americans, but your, your customer base in the case of Bud Light. Yeah. So I, I, I love to see, and people say, oh, this is, this is uh, you know, canceling people. No, this boycotting is different than canceling. You know, canceling is actively going after, uh, <laughs> attempting to change legislation, uh, doxing, being violent. Choosing not to buy a product through a boycott is, is not a cancellation by any means. But uh, I, I say that we continue to hold these companies uh, accountable for the way they market their products and services. And we tell them through our pocketbooks that enough is enough. Sell me your product, make it really good. And let's leave the social ideologies and the transgender derangement at home so I can just buy your product at a good cost for a high quality product that I need. There's totally. my soapbox today. And by that, the way, if you don't believe in a company and what they sell or the way they sell it, don't spend money. I mean, we've done the same thing with Disney Plus and some of these other streaming services that I just don't have access to because of their ideology. It's a shame. Just don't, just don't put it out there. Let people make their decisions. In the meantime, companies just go back to selling good stuff. Yeah. Well, and this is the drawback of, you know, from a business perspective where you, you got to be careful once you start playing the moral card as an organization, because for most companies, it's a complete lie. It's a, it's a lie, right? Like, the, the reality of it is most of those organizations are in, in existence and are focused on the transactional uh, space of providing value, period. Well, they should be. Yeah, and, and, but, but even, and I'm just saying it's like it's even a bad idea even if like regardless of my stance on my opinions of things, stay away from it because when, when things get difficult and you get boycotted or whatever, all of a sudden you're going to do what? Oh, Backpack. now those morals aren't all that important anymore. It's a lie. So don't even play in that space. And, and too many companies have done this where they, they latch on the, the void of, of morals within society. They raise their little flag saying, well, join us and we'll give you purpose and meaning in life. And, and because we're, we're taking a moral stance on things, but they're not in the grand scheme of things. They're not. Once the bottom line is affected, they're going to lay off just, just everybody else, just equally, just the same. And the moral stance on something was never a moral stance to begin with. It was just a hook, right? So it is better for organizations not even to play in that space anyway. But I think this actually, so as you said that, I had a little bit more nuance in the way I think about this, because what you said is that these companies are not principled and moral, in which I would agree. But- now that I say that, there are some ideologies, for example, that I would agree with within an organization. So, for example, Origin uh, and Montana Knife Company both happen to be great sponsors of this show and friends of mine. They have built their brand around American exceptionalism, building products made in America, putting employers to work or employees in America to work. And so you might very easily make the case, well, Ryan, if you say that these companies can't engage in that ideology, then why can't, why do these companies do and you agree with that? And here's the distinction. Well, you just made it. Those are principles that Origin and Montana Knife Company believe in and stand by. If they were unpopular, they would still run still their businesses by. like that. So yeah. if a company comes and they build a whole entire, let's say they build a, um, build a, a line of products based on the transgender community, by all means, every right to do that. Sure, I'm not going to do business with you, but you can and you know who your audience is and you appeal to them. 
and you build it off of principle. Those are your principles. We don't agree on them, but they are. That's the distinction. I don't like to see these companies trying to weave their way and weasel their way is probably a better word to say through the social landscape and what is culturally acceptable in order to sell their stuff. Make a stance, know who your audience is and sell to them. Totally, totally. So the the headline I had this week, and and it's just something I'm excited about, man. So um, Elon Musk and Vivint, uh, Vivek, they're launching a podcast. I'm not sure if you heard about this called the Doge Cast, and yeah. and they plan to outline all their government cost settings that they plan to do as part of the Trump administration. And I think it's brilliant, and 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 it's brilliant for a number of ways. And well, actually, it's brilliant in a number of ways. But the one I want to call out is the power of transparency. That's what it is, and and I love it. This is a prime example of they don't have to do this. But by being uber transparent, they will end up building trust. They will foster natural accountability within those organizations, with, with it, within society. And then they'll, they'll be like value alignment around what they're doing, strictly by over communicating what it is that they're doing. It, it is brilliant. When I think about what they might want to do, right? In that department, I think, oh my gosh, right? Like how many jobs are on the line? How many people might be totally upset at them cost cutting and them reducing, you know, certain departments or, or whatever. It would be very easy to demonize what they might do. And by them doubling down and being transparent, man, I, I think it will just ensure more success and more alignment around what they're doing. It's putting trust in people that we're smart enough to understand what they're doing, that are communicating it, and it will just drive accountability and it'll create massive momentum. So I, I'm just so excited about it. And, and it just reiterates the importance of transparency in our relationships, in organizations, and what we do. If we can't, I've, I've lately I've been on this kick from an organizational perspective. If you can't communicate it trans, in a very transparent manner, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Mm. If it can't pass the bullshit test and you can't tell people what you're doing, then you probably shouldn't be doing it at all. And, and I love that idea. And it's like, well, what if they, okay, well, they might. So you better communicate it better then and make sure it's really clear because what's even worse is when people find out about something that you weren't transparent about and then they're even more upset and then more trust is actually eroded. So I double down on the transparency. I agree. I love this. I, I'm in agreement with you. I, the quote that comes to mind is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. When you're communicating a message, if you do it simply then you are sophisticated. If it takes you some sort of weird dissertation and you know four hour or 10 hour lecture to promote something, maybe you haven't thought about it enough as you ought to. And it isn't other people's fault that they don't understand it. Um, yeah. I did see something on this that I thought was interesting in addition to what you said. Uh, I, I saw some numbers out there. They're looking at cutting trillions of dollars from, from the budget on an annual basis. That was interesting. Uh, The other thing that I thought was interesting is that there's talks and recommendations that when these departments and these are closed and these jobs are are cut, they cannot reassign those people in those jobs to other aspects of the government. I thought that was huge because if you do allow them to be reassigned, then exactly, then you're not actually really doing anything. Now, I imagine that those individuals can then go through the hiring process to work in other departments of the government, but I love the fact that we're not just going to automatically reassign. And you're right, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people, potentially, who are going to be laid off. I, I can have some empathy for that, but also I could lose my business at any given moment. You, you could be fired at any given moment as us oh. private citizens. So I think it should only be fair that you are on the same chopping block as everybody else. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. Hey, one other thing I wanted to talk about, I thought this could be, so we've been doing our headlines and I like doing our headlines and we've gotten some good feedback and response. I was thinking about this over the weekend. I don't know why. I think it'd be funny if, or interesting if we introduced a little segment, maybe we do this once every month called Controversation where we just bring up something extremely controversial that maybe is an unpopular opinion 
that we believe that maybe even guys listening don't necessarily believe or it isn't the cultural standard. And I yeah. thought that would be kind of a fun segment to mix things up, but also foster and facilitate some interesting dialogue and discussion. Yeah, that, that does sound fun. Um, before we move to questions, I actually, I, it just dawned on me and I thought, man, you know what? That wasn't a great headline. Maybe it was okay, but we're on the eve of Thanksgiving, right? So when guys hear this, Thanksgiving is tomorrow. And, and I wanted to share something. We've talked about this on the podcast. I don't know. Josh reached out to me. He's like, what episode did you talk about this? Um, and, and so it came more (laughs) present on my mind. Yeah. But, um, the origins of Thanksgiving and, and, and it's funny. I even did some, some testing last night that like I was asking like echo around the origins of Thanksgiving and how it got started. And, and the, the typical answers I always hears like pilgrims, right. They used to celebrate and, and we just kind of inherited it. That's not necessarily true. This is from George Washington. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November, next to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the uh, beneficent author of all good that was, that is, or, or that will be. And, and talk about us losing sight of kind of how Thanksgiving got started. And so, um, you know, as we go into Thanksgiving, um, you know, maybe do a little bit of research and look up George Washington's, um, proclamation of, of asking us to, to give thanks to our creator for our blessings. Uh, and, and he has some other thoughts in there where he talks about the unity of a nation. So I, I just thought that was a good thought for, for this Thanksgiving season. Awesome. Yeah. Well, but I mean... I didn't think the the country was founded in in faith based roots and beliefs. I mean, how how could he have ever said that? I, I can't that imagine possible? him saying that. Yeah, <laughs> I actually That's on crazy. that note, um, I was on one of our battle teams uh, the, over the weekend, and they are reading. Um, what is it called? I'm drawing a blank. Oh, citizenship and republic, Theodore Roosevelt's speech, and specifically the man in the arena portion of it. Um, if you guys haven't read that speech, not just the man in the arena segment, but the entire speech, I just printed it out. That is powerful. Go in and read that. Uh, that's, that's a cool exercise I think that you can do on your own and maybe just take a paragraph or two and then maybe even at dinner, talk about it with your kids. It yeah. taught when you talked about unity, but also not the rights, not only the rights that we enjoy, but the responsibilities that we have as men to uphold those rights, honor our traditions, speaking of Thanksgiving and leave the world a better place or this country a better place than what we founded as. That was interesting. Yeah. I love it. All right. All right. Questions. Let's get some questions. Yeah. Questions from the Iron Council. Isaac Niebert, networking is paramount. And I would say it's one of the most important parts of being successful. I suck at this. In a shockingly vast amounts of suck, what would you say is one of the best ways to network and get to know other successful men better? I tend to keep connections on a surface level as I've never had true loyalty in my life. And for me, it's hard to fully trust anyone. I try and I have hope about it and I want to be able to develop truly networking successfully with successful men. Uh, so the first thing is don't say you suck at it. Why are you going to get you better if you it. suck at it? Yeah, you, yeah. Just, you just assigned yourself to saying you're not good at this. And so regardless of how hard you try, you cannot improve. So yeah. you may not be proficient at it. I'll give you that. But that doesn't mean you can't learn it. Imagine going to jujitsu and saying, I suck at this after the first class. Like that doesn't sound like somebody who's going to go back and keep trying to get better. They've just resigned to being horrible at it. Yeah. So stop saying that. We got, we got to stop saying that first and foremost. Um, the other, and, and it's going to feel like a little bit like I'm, I'm slamming a little bit on him, but I, I'm just saying this because this is really important. From a networking perspective, you said, I don't trust people. I've never been able to find high levels of trust in people. I would suggest to you, and, and specifically this is important for marketing or uh, networking, and I'll tell you why here in a minute. If, you're, if that's your hangup, then you're doing it too selfishly. Yeah. You're like, well, well I can't trust anybody to do what they say they're going to do or to follow up or to give me this or give me that or whatever. It's all about you. 
And that is one of the biggest hangups I've ever seen with people networking. The best way to network is to meet people for the sole reason of formulating connections for others or solving problems. So for example, if I go to a networking function, and by the way, everything is a networking function. Even going on a a golf outing with buddies is a networking function if you have this mentality. And I don't suck at networking. I'm actually pretty good at networking. But here's why. I understand that the whole goal of networking is to find solutions for the people that I can network with. So Kip, if you and I are, let's say we're golfing, we've never met before. I got a buddy, he brought a buddy, that buddy brought you over and somehow we made this connection uh, at, at an afternoon of golf. And I start talking to you about what you're doing. You might say, you know, yeah, we're right in the process right now of, of landscaping our yard and God, we've just had such a hard time landscaping it and it's been miserable and fill in the blank. Well, if I go through my mental Rolodex of other people I've networked with and I happen to know a guy who's a landscaper, bingo. I just created an opportunity for you because you need help. I created an opportunity for my buddy who's a landscaper because he's trying to sell business. I also did a third thing. I created opportunity for myself and I made myself a little bit more indispensable than I was before because I'm the one that formulated the connection. So when you start making connections to other people, it is the lowest cost, highest return source of networking because the alternative is me coming over to do your landscaping and I don't know how to do it. So I'd have to put time and energy and resources and buy equipment and everything else. Yeah. That's all I did. And then I backed out graciously. And by the way, there's a very appropriate way to connect and to not connect people. Should I go through that or should I reserve that? No, I think it's valuable. Like, like, yeah, I think it's valuable. This is a huge mistake people make. So let's go to our analogy. You need a landscaper. I know a landscaper. Yeah. This is what most people will do. Without even asking, I have your number now, Kip, and I have my buddy, let's call him Joe, he's a landscaper, and I just send you a, both a message without ever asking. And I just say, hey, Kip, here's Joe, he does landscaping, you said he needed it, here you go. That's lazy, and it doesn't work. Yeah. You need to formulate, I call it a triangle, it's a networking triangle, and you need to connect all three dots, and here's how you do this. Please listen to me, this is very, very important. You do not ever, ever send an unsolicited email with contact information to somebody who didn't ask or give you permission to do it. And I get that all the time. People send me emails and they'll include me in the email and be like, hey, I think this guy would be a good podcast guest for you. And that guy's on the email. Yeah, that now that guy's gonna spam you. Yeah, you don't want that guy knowing your contact info. Well, or that, or maybe I'm not (laughs) interested in having that guy on my podcast. Totally. For for whatever reason. And now I have more work to do to say no. Yeah. 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 So here's how you do this. Hey, Kip, I have a buddy. His name is Joe. If you want, I can, I can connect you with Joe. He might be able to come out and look at what you got going on and maybe give you a quote or a proposal. Is that something you're interested in? And if you say no, say, hey, that's cool. If you ever want to, let me, let me know. I got somebody. If you say yes, then I go to Joe. Hey, Joe, I was golfing with a friend of a friend and we kind of made some connections and he was talking about getting some landscaping done in his yard. I know you've got a great business. Are you looking for new business right now? If he says, no, we're busy, then I have a responsibility to call you back, Kip, and say, hey, you know, I talked to Joe. They're busy right now. They can't take you in. He said he'd reach out in a couple of months or you can reach out to him. That's where you start formulating the connections, right? But let's say Joe, for the sake of argument, says, actually, yeah, we just had a bid finish or a job finish up and we're looking for a new job. So can you make an introduction? Sure. So that's how you make you talk to both parties individually. And once you get permission, then and only then, do you make the connection? So in the text or the email that I would send out, this is almost verbatim. Hey, Kip, uh, we went golfing, had a great time. You said you needed some landscape services. Let me introduce you to Joe. Joe, you've got a great business. Kip, he's done my landscaping. He's done a couple of other my friends. He does a phenomenal job. Joe, Kip, and I don't know each other well, but we had a really good connection on the golf course. And I know this is in your ballpark, I think this would be something you could really do. Here's the key right here. This is really important. I, and I say it almost verbatim. I'm going to bow out from here, but I'm glad that I could make 
connections to two people that I really respect. And I hope that you two can do some business together. And then you graciously bow out of it. Now, in a week, I'll probably follow up with you. Kip, did you talk with Joe? Yeah, I did. He's coming over tomorrow. Cool. Joe, did you talk with Kip? No, I've been so busy. Man, Joe, like, hey, we're buddies, but like Kip thinks you're going to be calling him and I put in a good word for you. Can you please call him? These are just the little things. And if you do that every single week and you start formulating and making these connections and building that Rolodex, you will never be hurting for being able to network again. But you've got to get over the selfish mentality of, what can I get? This guy doesn't ever do anything in return. How can I sell my wares and my stuff? Instead, how can I serve other people? And how can I begin to make connections that will serve everybody? And eventually, without fail, people are, Kip, if I do that and it helps you, you're going to ask what, I, what you can do to help me. Totally. And in that, in that space, I would actually have an answer for you. Too many people don't have an answer to that question. How can I help? I don't know. Don't do that. If somebody yeah. says, how can I help? Tell them exactly how you can help. You know, I've had people like that I don't really know all that well, but you know, they've enjoyed the podcast or whatever. Like, how can I help? And I used to say, I don't know, whatever. And now I say, you know what? Have you left a review yet? No. Oh, pfft. that alone. Would, have you texted that one episode you told me about to your dad or your brother? No, I haven't. Oh, would you do that? Like, that'd actually be helpful. I yeah. always answer a request for help with something they can do. That's a powerful totally. thing as well. Mm, I love that, man. You know, the only thing that I would add for Isaac here is, you know, I tend to keep connections at the surface level as I never had true loyalty in my life. And you already touched base on the idea. It's like, it's not about you. But one way to get past the whole loyalty thing or, or like trust, you're not trying to get them to like you or, or them to get to know you. Just be curious in people. Just be curious. You know, so at networking events, just learn. Go around, ask people, under, you know, understand what they do, what makes them tick, and that's it. No trust is required for you to know someone. So, so don't get wrapped up onto that too much and, and just be genuine in, in getting to know people. I, lately, I've been really stepping up my game. I usually have like a lunch once a week or every other week. And those lunches have zero intention. They're just to have lunch and talk shop or whatever we want to talk about. And that's it. And, and I'm trying to be very intentional about how I show up. Am I, the kind of, am I showing up in a way where I'm the kind of individual that someone says, oh, man, you know, I really like Kip. That's it. Not them. Like, I'm not going out of my way to make them try to like me. I'm just focused on trying to be a good connection for them and understand them. And ironically enough, when we do that, those are the kind of people that we like and appreciate, right? You'll be more likable, of course. Yeah, totally, because no one wants to hear the guy that just talks about himself and is trying to impress you the whole time. It's superficial, and you're like, that guy's annoying. Yeah. you know. So just go out and try to get to know people and, and understand them, and you'll feel 100% better. I, I also think on the being trusting part, and this was spurred on a little bit by one of our Iron Council members. His name is Alan Placer. He's been in the Iron Council for a long time, veteran member, big help in our leadership development. Uh, he had talked about this on our Friday call about the importance of just trusting. Just decide that you're going to trust that person. Now, yeah. are you going to give over your life savings and hope they are going to be prudent with it immediately? No. Are you going to bear all of your problems and talk about all your woes and short, no, but you can make a decision to trust somebody just because you want to trust them. And I think that requires just being a level, a, a level of honesty. It's going to be honest with people. Uh, and it requires a little bit of courage because that person might burn you, but we're not talking about brain surgery. We're not talking about your life savings. We're not talking about at this point, having your heart broken we're talking about being disappointed or being let down. Welcome to life. And if that's the worst that comes from trusting somebody as a default, the benefits of being trusting as a default vastly, vastly outweigh the potential shortcomings if we're talking about these minor trust exercises with new people. Yeah, yeah, totally. Elijah Elliott, how does one contend with the suffering of others, especially those close to him? 
Well, I, I, I'm going to steal a little bit, I think, from, from your playbook to contend. What are you, what are you contending with? Yeah. Like, what, what's the wrestle here? I mean, the, the, the reality is just a level of empathy. There's no contention in that. No. So, Kip, if you're going through a hard time, I don't need to contend with it. First, it's not my life. And second, I don't, I'm not fighting with you on it. I'm, I'm, I want to be on your side. Totally. So that requires empathy. And empathy is a lot. Of, I, I use that word deliberately because it is sacrificial. It is kind. It is considerate. It is based in truth. So I, I would say that's that generally that's how you would handle that. So Kip, if you're going through a very difficult time with, I don't know, a, a breakdown of a relationship, then my job is not to contend with that. My job is to realize as I've gone through relationship breakups, as we all have, that I can be here, I can give you a call, I can invite you out with the boys. Even if I'm not going to hang out with the guys, I can create something and say, hey, Kip, we're going golfing this weekend. You're coming. You don't have a choice. So I, I just think it requires sacrifice, kindness, consideration, love, truth. Because sometimes being empathetic requires a person to be honest, brutally honest with a person about their own performance yeah. or about things they're believing or acting on that aren't serving them. That's why interventions are so powerful if they're done properly. If you recognize that something's wrong with a person and you're a friend of that individual, then you have a moral responsibility to speak to them truthfully and plainly about what they're dealing with. So let's get over the whole contend with, I, I can't take on your problems as my own, meaning I cannot, I cannot emotionally be vested to the point where I'm sacrificing my own well-being or my other responsibilities. Mm. They're not, those are not my problems to carry. I have my own problems to carry and you are not responsible for carrying mine. But if I can teach you or support you or encourage you along the way to learn how to pick up your own problems and make your back strong enough to carry them, that's my responsibility. But yeah. I'm not gonna own your problems. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it's, and it's kind of built upon this premise. I think that a lot of us feel that the suffering that, that the individual suffering needs to contend with it. And we've, t we've talked about this on the podcast is sometimes like, sometimes that's not the purpose. Sometimes what we should be doing is sitting with it and gaining perspective and growing from it. It's not to to brush it off, to ignore it, to, you know, fight it. Maybe part of it is to sit with it and, and let us grow. Perfect timing, by the way, Adam Grant, he, he had a post this morning. I want to read this because I think it's profound. Oh, I he saw says, this one. The purpose of grief is not to cause pain. It's to keep memories of loved ones alive and remind us to make the most of our time. Moving forward after loss is not about erasing sorrow. It's about gaining perspective. That doesn't sound like- Did content. you see the second? No, yeah. did you see the second slide? The second slide's cool. With the jars? If I remember the jars where you have this jar that's you and your grief is filling up the entire jar. But as the image progresses, the grief isn't going away. The jar is becoming- Just gets bigger. Bigger. Yeah. So it becomes less relevant in your life the way it was before because you're growing and expanding and being better totally. than you were before. And, and it's just like every other form of suffering in life. We've had multiple scenarios by which our, we've had suffering where you could have chose to let it break you or strengthen you. And, and strengthening it wasn't ignoring it and pretending it wasn't there. It was being with it, sitting with it, right. right? And growing from it. And and we need to normalize that a little bit more often, I think, in society where it's like, man, we're, we're they're in it, they're suffering. And and what are we gonna learn and grow from this experience? Right. And and that's how we end up better men. Right. And and ironically enough, that's the formula. So anyone listening that that has a past that you regret. That's the formula of, of a bad past, by the way. By the way, that's, 
That's the formula of moving beyond regret in your life. It is become a better version of yourself. So much that you can't help but look at that experience and say, I'm kind of grateful that it happened because if it didn't, I wouldn't be who I am today. That's how you right. deal with hardship, suffering, and regret is by leveling up. And it's when we don't level up that we just drag the suffering along with us because the suffering defines us, not us rising above it. Yeah. There's only one other thing I would add is two questions that you might ask yourself. What does he need and what can I do? Does he need you to just listen to him? Does he need you to put his arm around him and give him a hug? Does he need you to invite him out to hang out with the guys? Does he need you to say, what the hell is wrong with you? What does he need? Listen yeah. to your intuition. I think your intuition will guide you, especially if you know this person and you know yourself. You guys are friends for reasons. You're in relationships like these for a reason. You know each other. You resonate with each other. And then what can you do? And don't, by the way, don't say, what can I do? I mean, you might say that, but that, to me, that's a lazy yeah. That's a lazy thing. If, if in the right context, yes, sure. But generally, I think if you just say, hey, how can I help? It's because you don't want to help. Yeah. If you really wanted to help, you would identify and you can ask, hey, would it help if you came and spent time with me this weekend with the guys? But have a plan. Have something you're going to do. Recognize a gap and fill it. Give them an opportunity to say yes or no. But you don't need to ask them what because – Man, if somebody's in that position, they may not know what you can do. Yeah. They may not know what they need, but you're seeing it from a different perspective. Yeah. And you might be you might need to be a little default aggressive. You know, I had a good friend that of course had his his spouse die a few years back and it was just like, "Hey, next weekend we're doing a trip." Like mm -hmm. it wasn't a well, what do you think? Not an option. What could we do? I'm like, "No, no, no, we're going to go. It'll be great." Are uh, you sure? Yeah, absolutely. Let's just go. Let's get away for a little bit, you know, and, um, or thing, even in things like that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kip. I thought, you no, no, finished. that's all I was going to say. Even in things like that, you know, there might be a cost associated with those things. Pay, just pay for the guy. Yeah. Cause he's going to come up with excuses not to do it. So it's like, he might say, Oh, how much is it? Say, don't worry about it. We got to cut. We got you covered. Yeah. Like that, that, that might be the barrier that keeps him from doing it. And, don't, and if he's like, no, 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 say, great, then you can pay me. Well, no, I don't have any money. Great, then you can come on me. <laughs> like, those are, those are the only two options. <laughs> You're not getting yeah. out of this. So, yeah. yeah. Love it. Tony Behel, how do you decide or balance involvement with your kids with outsourcing their interest development? Example, Ryan with your older son in powerlifting. We can certainly dig in and learn and guide them on a topic, but we can't be everything at all times. Thank you, gents. So I've done a lot of coaching for my kids as they've grown up. And my 16-year-old, I don't, I don't coach him anymore because everything that he's doing has outpaced my coaching ability. My 13-year-old, you know, there might be some things. My daughter, uh, she's 11. She asked if I'd coach soccer in the spring. I can coach 11-year-old soccer. My, my youngest, uh, he, he wants me to coach, he wanted me to coach basketball, but they, to, to their credit and to the, another father who's doing it, he was there, like, it was, it was, it's not usually like that, but there was co plenty of coaches to go around. So I didn't need to, but I'll continue to coach him. But I think where you need to start bringing in other people is when your capacity to help them grow has outpaced yours. If I cannot help push my children past their current capabilities, then I need outside help because there's yeah. nothing I can do about it. I can't teach them things I don't know. Imagine, to go back to jujitsu, imagine training with your kids from the time that they're, I don't know, five, six, seven years old, and now they're 13, 14 years old, but you stopped going to jujitsu and they kept going. Now you're five years deep. You might be physically stronger than them, but they know way more than you. It would be... Yeah egotistical and idiotic for you to say, Hey, no more classes. I'll teach you from here. Yeah. No, keep them going. And then to round it out. And the other part of this question is then you support them. 
So you don't bad mouth their coach. I've seen a lot of people do that. Like, oh yeah, because your coach is an idiot. Well, yeah, <laughs> he's better than you. Yep. He's, totally. he's the one out there with your son or daughter on the field. He's the one pouring into it. You don't like the way he's doing it. Then you figure out a way to do better. Or here's another one that people will do. My mom taught me this lesson years and years ago. Don't undermine the people that you're asking to help your children mm. by saving them from important discussions with those coaches. And I'll give you the example. So my junior year, no, excuse me, my senior year, I got pulled out of a baseball game and the coach pulled me and I didn't really know why. And I told my mom, I said, Hey, he pulled me like, what, what the heck? She's like, I don't know. Go ask him. Because that was the conversation that needed to take place. It wasn't my mom's conversation to have. And she was wise enough in that moment to say, you figure that out. Wise enough to say, I don't know. And so I went and talked to the coach and we had a, a discussion about it. And ultimately I could decide to stay on the team and be a contributing member and help, or I could quit if I wanted to, but I decided to stick around. And in the grand scheme of things, it was, it was frustrating in the moment, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm glad I did. So if you have somebody else who's coming in, don't undermine the person that you enlisted to help your child, but you can be excited about it. And the best way to do that is to go to their meets, to go to their practices, to go to their plays, to go to their recitals, to take them on things, activities and events and weekends on things that they're interested in, and then you get interested in it. So with my son, if it's powerlifting, I'm not real interested in powerlifting, but I can learn about powerlifting so that I can have an intelligent discussion. And then when he shares things with me, I can actually be curious because I have some baseline knowledge of what is good and what's good form and what's accurate and what isn't. I can follow the same people that he follows. In my case, I can even have those people on the podcast because I know he would be excited about that. So look for ways to edify, to support, to uplift the instructors and coaches and mentors that you're bringing in. And then in the meantime, do your backend work to be interested in the thing that they're interested in. Yeah, that's spot on, man. I can't help but see the correlation, right? Of course, between this parenting and leadership, and it's the same concept. You know, we have this as part of our leadership development program where we talk about one of the ways to ensure that you're trustworthy as a leader is to be capable. And it's funny because I always have to talk about this part of it, right? It's like, well, fully capable. Well, yeah. And then people get sideways and think, oh, well, then I have to know everything to be able to be a leader, to be trustworthy. And it's like, no, no, no. There becomes a point where you won't have the skill set. And by the way, if you try to pretend you do and you bullshit it, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That even erodes trust more. So the example True. that you gave of like the, the parent that's coaching their jujitsu kid, but they've never trained a day in their life. Trust me, your kid is not thinking higher, thinking more highly of you. <laughs> They're thinking less right. of you, right? Because you're bullshitting your, your capability. So what is this capability that we need to have? Once we, st once we don't have the capacity, like the same exact capacity that they need or like the, the technical skill or the skill set itself, it's then you need to move to being resourceful and sound reasoning. So now near you as a father, you're being resourceful. You know where to go, how to bring in different coaches, how to promote that coach. And you have sound reasoning and advice to him when he's struggling with that. But you, you get out of the technical coaching because you, you don't have the skill set for it. So you need to move to being resourceful and, and have sound reasoning instead. Well, I like this, that you're talking about being resourceful. That I mean, that, and also the trust building aspect of it because, I mean, this is going back to all of the things that we're talking about. When it comes to being resourceful, that's networking. Yeah, totally. When it comes back to, we were talking about, I can't remember, I'm looking through my notes here, but we were talking about, it might've been on that same topic of being, being trusting and having trust for other people. So all of these questions yeah. and these answers tie in together. But yeah, networking isn't just professional, but if I have a robust, large network of connections, then if my kids need help with math tutoring or they need help with powerlifting, I can just go into that Rolodex and pull somebody right up and say, hey man, here's what we need help with. And I can get those answers and get those solutions. Uh, here's one other consideration. Imagine being the bottleneck to your children's growth. 
because you're too arrogant to uncork yourself and get out of the way. Isn't, isn't that what you want as a parent? Like my oldest son and I, because he's 16 years old, sometimes we butt heads and sometimes he wants to compete with me, which is fine. That's good. And that's healthy. He's trying to figure it out. When he beats me at something, he gloats and he rubs it in and he doesn't <laughs> let it live or die. What he doesn't realize yet, and he will, is yeah. that doesn't upset me. The fact that he's stronger than me does not upset me. Now, it's not an excuse not to get stronger. And so I yeah. do work out and I do train. I am trying to be stronger than him because I know like, I can lead the way. But I don't get mad when my, one of my kids does better at something than me. That's exactly what I want. Yeah. And in order for them to have things that maybe I didn't have or opportunities that weren't available to me or a skill set that I don't currently possess, I have to bring in other resources. So totally. don't bottleneck because you want to be the savior to your kids. What a horrible, yeah. horrible, selfish thing to do. And they don't, they don't believe it anyway, right? So it's like you no. just look like more of a fool, you know, pretending yeah, that you have your for shit sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. All right, what's next? All right, Joshua Collins, what are some Thanksgiving traditions that you and Kip do and why are they important to you? I don't, I mean, my Thanksgivings are different <laughs> than like last year, the kids weren't with me for the first time in a very long time. So that was yeah. weird. That's kind of weird. Uh, yeah. That first, first yeah. holiday or whatever. So yeah. kind of sucks actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, this year they're with me for Thanksgiving, but they're with their mom for Thanksgiving weekend, you know, but I don't really have anything out of the like abnormal yeah. You know, whether it's like breaking the wishbone or having turkey or whatever, which we might actually be, be uh, changing up this year. We might not be doing turkey this year. So we'll, we'll see. But um, yeah, it's the same. I, I don't know. I, I don't really ever get into like that stuff too much. Just maybe it's my personality. Maybe I should. I don't know. Maybe you have some ideas, Kip, because yeah. I don't really know. We just do that what everybody else does. Yeah. We have a couple things that I think are unique that we do. So, um, First, we go around and we, we express what we're thankful for. And, and usually Thanksgiving is not just our family. Usually we have like 30 to 50 people at our Thanksgiving dinner. That's crazy. It's gnarly. The whole downstairs basement, uh, you've been at the house, Ryan, like yeah. that whole down yeah. is just tables, just stacked full of tables. Just and rows and rows of tables. Rows and rows of people. And so we go around and we, we, we give thanks of what we're grateful for. And then, uh, and then at the end of the night, we actually, um, we, we'll actually, um, well, in fact, I'm getting two holidays mixed up. I was going to say we have a talent show, but that's uh, Christmas Eve that we do that. That's so Christmas. The, yeah. So the, the expression of, of gratitude, like what we're grateful for, I mean, to be frank, it, cause it matters. Right. And we're yeah. trying to model this behavior to all these kids that like, Hey, life's good. And, and, and you need to express what you're grateful for. And so I, I think that's why it's important to us. And, and to be frank, like this year, I think I'm going to change things up. I, I'm going to add a, a tradition, literally. I'm going to find that speech um, that George Washington gave around the point of Thanksgiving. And I plan to read that every Thanksgiving from now on. Uh, just cool. to level yeah. set of like, why, why do we celebrate this holiday and make sure that it's present for everybody? I also think it's important to explain why gratitude is important because sometimes it just gets mm -hmm. pushed off. And for me, the most yeah. important thing with gratitude is it changes my mindset because it's so easy to wallow around our own pity and to throw pity parties and talk about totally. how bad it is, or you missed that or missed that, or that guy's better than you. And this person's better at this than that. And it's so easy to get down that, that cycle, but I'm a pragmatic person. If, if I'm doing something, it has to have a real practical, element to it. And so for me with gratitude, what it does is it opens up more opportunities that I don't see before. Because if I go stomping my feet around and marching around and I'm all pissed off about why I don't get breaks and why people don't like me or why that person's business is better than mine, I will quite literally close myself off to potential opportunities that exist, but I'm incapable of seeing them. But I've noticed that when I'm a more grateful person, 
and I am optimistic about life. I recognize the abundance and prosperity that I have. It is amazing to me how many more people present opportunities or how, how much more open I am to new ideas, to new investments, to different types of conversations with people. And it creates, as I said, a very practical reason for being grateful in your life outside of the, it's good for you and it makes you feel better. I get it. It does personality wise. Got it. Yeah. But what is it actually going to do? That's what it does. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. All right. Damien, you do. Oh, so I was going to ask you. Oh yeah. Favorite Thanksgiving food. Uh, honey and baked worst. ham. Honey baked, honey baked ham, ham without ham. a doubt. I can get behind yeah. that. I got to have the honey baked ham. Oh, and my devil. Worst. Egg. Worst? That's okay. That's fair. Yams. Yeah, worst. Yams and Dude, cranberries. I'm with you. Dude, uh, and cranberry sauce. Cranberry. Like, cranberry, where they slice it and it's like jelly. I don't want cranberry things and Nasty. I do not want yams. They put marshmallows <laughs> and stuff. I'm like, get that away from me. Send more stuffing. I don't want those yams. I don't want those cranberries. Yeah, those are the <laughs> worst two things. I'm like, that's just I nasty. I don't even know. I, agree. Like, <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. Kip, just be That's grateful funny. that you guys can even have yams, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop complaining. <laughs> All right. Uh, Damien Yado, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on setting uh, ground rules with parents over the holidays when they're visiting from out of town. My mother is a diehard liberal, very vocal about politics. She's surrounded herself with other people that all have the same views as her, and she makes comments offhandedly as if it, it's a sentiment that everyone in the room shares, which is far from the case. While I'm fine with folks having opposing beliefs, I can handle civil discourse. It doesn't seem like the best use of our time and energy when she's visiting over the holidays. Any advice on setting boundaries around topics would be much appreciated. I think the easiest thing that you can do in this situation is to look up voter registrations for everybody who's coming to your house prior to Thanksgiving (laughs) and just don't invite diehard liberals. That's pretty easy. <laughs> if they've ever contributed to Done. the Democratic Party uh, or, you know, that you can see their political affiliation, that's an easy way to do that. And while you're at uh-huh. it, just like get the legal paperwork in place <laughs> to like disown them as a, as a family exactly. member. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, look, I mean, I don't, I don't know the extent to which she does this. You know, you did say a comment like she presents these ideas as if they're universally true or whatever. Well, you do that too. Yeah, yeah. Right. We, everybody does it, regardless of what spiritual beliefs you have, regardless of what political beliefs you have, you wouldn't have that belief if you didn't believe in it. So every time that I open my mouth, I'm always saying things and people say, that's an opinion. Of course it's an opinion. I never said it wasn't, but I don't need to preface my discussion or talking points with this is my opinion. We're all smart enough to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, again, depending on the level to which she does this, if it's just obnoxious and annoying, in the moment, a quick correction. Hey, mom, let's cut it out. Let's let's keep it on a different topic today, can we? Yeah. It, it might be something as simple as that. Yeah. Uh, if it's something that is more severe or it continues to happen, then I would probably have a phone call. And so I'd get on the phone. Hey, mom, like I know you're coming for the weekend. Man, we're excited. The kids are excited. We love having you. It's so exciting. Can I please make a request? Do you see the humility in that, the way I framed that, first of all? Yeah. Can I please make a request? It's not, hey, I need you to do some things or not do some things. It's, hey, can I, I just make one? It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need to shut it. Not I need you to. You need to shut it. Yeah. Hey, mom, can I, can I just make a simple request? Sure, yeah. I mean, she's reasonable, I'm sure. Say, hey, look, I, I really, we've had blowups, family blowups. We've done family gatherings and like the whole politics, it just, it makes a mess out of things and, you know, you make jabs and so do I, and it's fun to a point, but I think the last couple of years, it just seems to have gotten out of hand. And, and my request this year would be, can we just not do that this year? Can we keep the emphasis on family and God and gratefulness and enjoying each other's company and being kind and tolerant and fun with each other? If she's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, I mean, you have some choices to make in that case, right? But I think she's probably going to say, yeah, we can do that. And you know what will happen? She'll say yes, but then she'll cross the line. But in yeah. that case, you need to say this. 
privately, by the way, you don't do this publicly. Um, hey mom, you remember last week I asked you about not making this difficult with some of those political discussions? Like we just want to be here and be present. This is the line I'm talking about. Yeah. Can you, we please refrain from this and just move on? Like if you want to hash it out over politics, I'll do that with you. We can do that next week or whatever. But here, I don't want to do that. So I'm just asking that we don't do that. That's the line that I was talking about. Totally. I think, yeah, I can- I think those little adjustments are enough, but there is an interesting phrase and quote that I've latched onto is, especially when it comes to boundaries, we encourage what we tolerate. So yeah. if you've never said anything before, <laughs> or you never call it out in the moment, not only does she think it's okay, she actually thinks it's welcomed. Yep. So you have a responsibility, especially for your family, your kids, your wife, your other family members who want to enjoy the holidays together to actually bring something up ahead of time if, if it's needed and then to make corrections in the moment privately and with respect if they happen. Totally. And this just reiterates the importance of us to be able to manage our, our emotional responses to things, right? Because everything that you just said is super easy to do when you're not fired up. Right. But, yeah. but if someone says something off the table and I take it as a personal attack and my blood starts boiling, you know what I mean? Then good luck doing that really well, right? You, 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 it's going to be obvious that you're in, a, in an emotional state. And you're probably going to say something you shouldn't be saying. So, you know, just as a, you know, and I know this is not part of the question, but just like, man, guys, if, if you get riled up and mad because someone disagrees with you politically, you need to figure that out. You need to figure out why you can't emotionally <laughs> have someone else disagree with you and you not get pissed off. That's a problem. A good and, point. and you're not going to be able to deal with boundaries or anything else if you can't control your emotions. Well, and, and as the man of the house, I would also say it's your responsibility to nip it even publicly in a way if, if you have to. So, for example, let's say your brother says something stupid because he's an instigator and yeah. he's, starting, he's trying to rile mom up and then mom's getting riled up and now they're going back and forth. You're the man of the house. So it's your job to say, hey, guys, stop, stop, time out, time out. Hey, can I just say something? Like, let's table that conversation. Why don't we go around the table and everybody can share what they're grateful for? Because I want to change the tone of what's happening here. And they will do that because people need other people to be assertive and they need direction and they need leadership and they will follow it. And if they don't follow it, then, then you move it from there. I had a conversation with a friend uh, just, just about a week or so ago, and we were getting a little bit heated with each other uh, about some, in, uh, some differences in, in the way that we run business and things like that. And I could, like, both of us were agitated, yeah. but I noticed that he was getting really fired up and his, the volume of his voice was speeding up or getting louder. And his tone was more agitated, like it was getting worse. And I said, whoa, whoa, let, hey. And I stopped the mid-sentence. I said, let, let's just stop for a second. We're not going to do it this way. We can have a conversation about it. We can disagree. We can come to some sort of consensus. But we're going to bring down the tone of the conversation. Yeah. And I said it just like that. And he's like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're, you know, you're right. I will. And he brought it down to his credit and I brought mine down and we actually had a really productive conversation. We walked away with some understandings and it was actually productive. But had I not said anything, it would, he would have got more and more angry. Then he would have said something that would have got me angry. And then all of a sudden it becomes a shouting match and we blow up business and we blow up friendship just because none of us, neither one of us were willing to say, hey, well, let's bring the temperature down. That's your job. It's your house, your place, your rules. You're the man, you're the leader. It's not your wife, not your kids, not your grandpa, not whoever. It's you. So you dictate the tone of the environment over the holidays. Yeah, yeah, good call. So a question from Jay. Um, you know, publicly just congratulate Jay in his retirement. Uh, from New Jersey, yeah. right? From the New Jersey yeah. Police Department. So yep. appreciate uh, you, Jay. Years appreciate of service. 
Yeah, appreciate you, Jay. Appreciate all that you do. Um, and he has a great question. And, I, and it's funny because Jay had a, like a preface, like, oh, I want to preface this. I'm like, there's, the preface is not needed. I didn't, he, I didn't think so either. Yeah. Just what he said. Or did you want to read the preface? No, I don't want to read the preface. Uh, it, it's not needed. I'm just saying because people might be interested. Where I, Basically, he said, hey, it's just my thought on it or whatever. It's like, yeah, but if you have this thought, other people have this thought. And it, the question is completely relevant. So I love the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. He says, when do we stop debating what it means to be good at being a man and just be one? I often feel my father and grandfathers didn't debate what it meant to be good at being a man. They just were. I think this is a product of the times and our progressive nature of culture. We, we live in the information age. That's what mm -hmm. we're in. So yeah. everybody is dealing in information, including order of man. But when our grandfathers were around, they weren't dealing with information. They were dealing with application. They were in the fields, laboring in the fields. They were in the factories, building products. They were building bridges and building roads and new construction and erecting buildings and uh, being cowboys and you know, like all the things that we used to do as men that we just don't do today because we're operation, operating in this information age, that we have access to more information than we've ever had. And part of the problem, although I do love this problem to some degree, is that we live in a social media era. So everybody has a platform. Everybody has an equal opportunity to pontificate on anything and everything, regardless how ignorant or intelligent they are about a subject. And it has led to continual debate and discussion about things that just don't need to be discussed. Oh, it doesn't matter, yeah. Now, yeah. I will say this is not an entirely new phenomenon. That we have men like Marcus Aurelius who actually said that quote, I believe, but he was a philosopher. So he spent plenty of time thinking about, <laughs> writing about, <laughs> discussing, you know, you have Seneca and you have Epictetus and all of the ancient Stoic philosophers who just continue to pontificate. And then you have people today, you know, Jordan Peterson comes to mind, Andrew Huberman, like these guys who are very intelligent and information driven. And that's not to take away anything from guys like that, but it's a lot easier to discuss ideas than it is to apply them. And I'm not, yeah. by the way, I'm not saying that towards Andrew Huberman or, jo or Jordan Peterson. I'm just saying in general, Kip, it's a whole lot easier for you and me to say, hey, here's how you handle your kids than to handle them tonight when you get home from work. Yeah. And we have so many different ideas. You know, we used to operate, this is a multifaceted problem, but when <laughs> our grandpa, grandpa, grandfathers were kids and our great grandfathers, they were operating in local small communities and villages and, and tribes. So for me, for me to question what the tribe did meant ostracization from the tribe and personal alienation and potential risk because we operate and our access to information outside of the tribe was greatly diminished, if not non-existent. In fact, the only thing I knew about the other tribe or the other village is those people are evil and they try to take our land and steal from us. And so my job is antithetical to what theirs is. They were the enemy. And now we live in this global, very deeply connected society where I could very easily hear an idea from a man in China just as easily as I could hear an idea from my next door neighbor. Totally. And so all of these ideas are coming at us in different ways and we're bombarded all the time. And so we constantly have to contend with opposing viewpoints that we just didn't have to contend with 200, 500, 1,000 years ago. There was no contending viewpoint. And if there was, you went to war with that tribe and they killed you and took your women or you killed them and took theirs. Yeah. Well, it's a little well, different now, so I think that's part of it. Well, and, and specific to Jay's example of his father and his grandfather is, you know, we're not doing probably as good as we used to in regards to modeling. How, how often have we heard that question? What does it mean to be a man? I don't have someone in my life 
mm-hmm. that has taught me, right? So it's causing a conversation because the modeling is absent. People don't know what it looks like, unfortunately. And so there is discussions around something so simplistic that generations will go, it would be a silly question. Can you imagine asking your dad that? I can't even imagine asking my dad that. Hey, dad, what's a man? He'd be like, what, what's wrong with you? Like, right? Like, don't you'd be probably an idiot. Like, yeah, Smack you'd probably be in the like, back of the head. Keep shoveling, right? Stop trying <laughs> to like get out of work, right? Like he would think it's stupid <laughs> that I'd ask that question. And now that question's normal, which is super sad, right? And so I, I think it's a lack of modeling. You know, to your point, Jay, when you have the modeling of a great father and a great grandfather in your life, it is silly to ask the question, what does it mean to be a good man? You know, unfortunate part, there might be people in society today that don't know. They have no idea because men have neglected that responsibility, unfortunately. Well, and he, so here's what I would say, and I think you're spot on with that, Kip, is when we started Order of Man almost 10 years ago now, so next year will be 10 years. And I used to say this, maybe I should say it more, but- I don't know if you remember, I used to say a lot, our job is to bridge the gap between what we know and what we do. Hmm. And when I looked around 10 years ago, what was available in this now what we call men's space, it wasn't then, but what we call the men's space now is a lot of fluff, a lot of talk, and a big gap between applying the information. And that's what Order of Man was and, and is, and that's what Iron Council was established for. So maybe we need to illustrate that a little bit more. But what I would suggest to you, and I don't know the ratio, so let me just throw these out as arbitrary numbers, is that you spend a one-to-one ratio on consumption of information and application of it. Or maybe it's two-to-one. One One part information, two parts application. Again, I don't know what the ratio is, but if we start thinking about it like that, maybe we put more books down and then we actually go out and go golfing with our buddy. Do. Yeah. Right? Maybe we don't jump on YouTube. We rebuild the carburetor in the truck that we've always wanted to build. Or we go take a martial arts class. Or we go to a firearms course or instruction. So whatever information... That, that is one of the problems with information age is you'll hear, hear guys... And they take so much pride in reading 100 books. How many books did you read this year? I read 100 books in 2024. Why? Why? What about just two or three? Maybe four. I'll give you four. One per quarter. And then the rest of the time was start was, was uh, application of the information you had. Go ask 20 people today, whether it's at the gym or at your work or wherever. Just ask them this question. How you doing? What would they say, Kip? The majority of them, do you think? If well, how how are, or how was your day like or what how no what just saying like done today or or how was your day or how are you doing one of those two questions what well, do you think the answer do, would be doing good really busy we wear it as a badge of honor yeah. busy busy with what now if you answered yeah. that question truthfully you'd start to document that you were busy with a lot of bull crap that you should not have been busy with <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think there's a ratio there that maybe is tilted and uh, maybe it's time we consider how to bring that back. Yeah, yeah, I like that. All right, last question. All right. Joe Gunter, recently I've been thinking about a story where a father had a vision of a family going through trials and tribulations and the majority of the family made it to the end of the path and celebrated together as a family. But some of the family did not make the journey. One son wanted to know deeper meaning of this vision, so he asked and he was given the same and a basic tutorial about his father's vision. My question is this. What are some of the things your father saw and experienced that the lessons he passed on to you still resonates with you today? You know, I didn't really have a very close relationship with my father. I I loved my father. In fact, I just pulled up last night um, his Facebook page. He's, Hmm. He's passed away now but I pulled up his Facebook page and I saw pictures of him when he was younger. And I saw one where he was sitting there smiling with my sister on his back when she was probably, I don't know, five, six years old. Like it was a, it was, 
it was kind of hard to go through. Even now, I feel like a little bit emotional as I as I think about that. Yeah. So we didn't have this close relationship. And in a lot of ways, I had a lot of resentment towards my dad for not being around or for perceived abandonment. I don't feel that way now, but that's how I perceived it when I was growing up. Um, I think he made bad choices. And I think given the chance he would have made, I, I, I have to hope that he would have made different choices. And I probably would have too when it yeah. came to our relationship. But one thing that I've always admired about my dad is that he always had a lot of heart in anything that he did. And he was so talented. He was so incredibly talented. And he was able to connect with people in a way that I have never seen before. Hmm. People loved him. Um, he, he did paint for most of his life. And why he never started his own store, I'll never know, but he didn't. And so he always worked with other places, other companies and other organizations. And he moved up in those companies very quickly but he always was on the sales floor. He did a little mixing and things like that, but he was always on the floor in these paint stores. And during the summers, I would go spend time with him. And there, the bosses would let me come in. I was young, probably 12, 13 years old. And I would go stock paint in the back. And I would inventory it and stock it. And the boss, you know, sometimes they'd give me a $100 bill or whatever for doing work over the weekend. It was a lot of fun. But I observed my dad in those moments. And I was always... Just a little emotional. Always blown away with his ability to connect and relate with people and bring down walls. And it was just, it was amazing. And I can't really think of a better skill set than that. Because everything that we do in life is to connect with other people. We have to be connected with other people. There's no decision that we've ever made in life, personally, professionally, romantically, et cetera, that did not involve another person. And I learned a lot just by seeing him do that. And I never felt like it was a game or a charade or a, like a, a thing that maybe he didn't even have to learn. I just felt like he was always curious, always pretty optimistic and joyful about life and just loved people. I'm not always the same, loving pe the loving people part. <laughs> but, uh, but that is a lesson that has stuck with me is like, how do you relate and connect with people? And he taught me it's curiosity and just having a genuine desire to see other people do well and be good. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, probably for me, it would be my dad's relentless work ethic. Um, part of it is, is due to the nature of his work, right. That he chose to take on, you know, like, uh, when I was younger, it was a, a dairy farm and anyone that's been raised on a dairy farm, you, you can't skip. There's no, <laughs> the, the cows yeah. have to be take, milked, take right? a day like, off. <laughs> you yeah. can't take a day off, you know? And, and eventually he sold that dairy farm. He could have sold the farm. He, he, he didn't have to continue working that farm. He eventually, uh, ended up being a coal miner because farming never makes enough money. And so he farmed, he was a coal miner, and then he was a butcher. And I have never, I've never heard him complain once about work. He just did it because it needed to get done. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> never... I, I just, and it's fascinating to me. And, and, and to be frank, it's probably the, the, the greatest gift he ever gave me was the gift of work. And, and I, and I say that with the idea of the experience when I think about it is, you know, I don't know, waking up Saturday morning, having to wake up early on a Saturday morning when you're a teenager and you're thinking like, you know, I should be able to sleep in. And going out and working all day long until it's dark. And, and those moments of walking back to the house, feeling great of all the stuff that I did that day. And that, that was the ultimate gift um, that he gave me. He was just relentless. And, and then ironically enough, and these are things I don't, I can't give him credit for when I was younger. I, th these are things I realized later in life, but I've never heard him ever talk bad about anybody. 
and I never mm. heard him talk bad about my mom, not once. And he has plenty of reasons to, to, to do both, but I've never heard him talk ill of her, not once. And not only that, I later learned how smart he was. He was highly smart, but he never, never acted like smarter than anybody. And he really is like, so in just insanely humble, a very humble individual and was just focused on getting the job done. And those were the main things that, uh, that I got from him for sure. You know, what's interesting is you were sharing that Kip. I don't, I, I never met your dad, but, um, and both of our fathers have passed away now. I know both of us in, in our own way had strained relationships with our fathers. Yeah. And what's interesting to me is you were sharing that is that in spite of the strain that you and I each had with our individual fathers, there's still so many redeeming qualities because we choose to see them. Yeah. Like it's easy. And in fact, I think there's situations in both of our lives and I won't get too personal. It's easy to see why other people may choose not to. Yeah. And to actually empathize a little bit with that. But we've decided that we will. You know, Sometimes people say like, oh, what's, what's like, what kind of questions do you like? Or what's your favorite question? That question right there, the, who, what, what's his name? Sorry. You close I closed it too the bra- early. I closed the window. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it while you're pulling it up. Okay. The way that question was framed and just the question, that might actually be, and doing this for almost 10 years now, that might actually be my favorite question ever. Because it got me thinking about some things, like some memories that I had not thought about for a very long time. Joe Gunter. So I Gunter. really appreciate that question. Joe Gunter. Yeah, I really appreciate that yeah. question. That's a good one. Yeah. Well, and it's, and it's funny how the <clears throat> lessons, by the way, the lessons keep coming. Mm. They keep coming. Like, I, I was just talking with my wife about this just a couple weeks ago. When I was in third grade, I moved away from my dad. And lived, and and for all intents and purposes, you would assume my parents got separated or divorced, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't move back until high school. They never got divorced. And our moving was on my mom's terms. And I can't help but look back at that and go, if, if my wife came to me and say, hey, you know, I'm gonna take the kids and move around. You know, you stay here, keep working. Fund our moving around. We'll pick up a never extra rent wherever we go. And you just keep plugging away and you'll be here for when we come back. Mm. There's no way I'd put up with that. <laughs> right? Uh, selfishly. And, and he did, right? But, but that's something that I never even, cons- like, it never even crossed my mind. I'm like, that's really weird. Little did I realize what that probably meant to, for him, what mm-hmm, hardship yeah. that brought, how difficult that was for him, how unloving that probably felt. And, and but in my 40s, it finally dawns on me. You know right, what I mean? That dawns on you. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Crazy. Okay. Well, guys, those are some great questions today. I took a lot of notes. My head was down a lot because I'm taking notes and I, I have, I have, hundreds and hundreds of ask me anything notes in my folders and everything else. I very rarely go back through them, but man, I should spend some time going back through them and just like see if anything stands out to me. But that was a powerful one. I'm gl- I'm grateful for yeah. those uh, questions today. Yeah. Thank you guys. So a couple things, um, store.orderofman.com. That's where you can go to get your order of man swag. We have uh, a, a resurplus of Forrester windbreakers and order That's of man hoodies. Right here. Yep. So the windbreaker is the one I, so I have this one, there's a black one and then there's the, um, it's a, I call it clandestine, but it's like the stealth camo. So it's black and gray. It's very subtle, but it's the same windbreaker and this black and gray, subtle camo. And then of course our high quality hoodies, it's green tan and black with the order man crest and logo on the front. Those are, that's an everyday type wear, uh, wear for me. Do you remember when we went out to, uh, uh, Minnesota. I don't know if he didn't have it on this time or maybe he did, but Matt's dad, Tom had, uh, did he wear his green order of man hoodie while we were out there at all? Did you see it or notice it? I saw, I, I think he did because I saw him with order of man gear on. I don't know if that was the same one or not, but so he has one that's like kind of 
you know, put together fairly new. And I'm like, where's your other one? He's like, oh, that one's at home. That's my good one. And that, that's the he one that's like one bleached and out one. and stained. No, the one that's like gross in the pocket I know is ripped off. And I think right here is ripped. He yeah. loves that hoodie, man. He's had it for like six years or something at this point. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so every year it's funny because every year i usually will send him a hat or a hoodie or something every year for like five yeah. years and every time i see him he has that one that i gave him five years ago and that's all he wears yeah. it's hilarious to me but hey that's funny. good hoodie is hard to find <laughs> yeah that's store.orderman.com for the hoodies and then the other call out is we have the the men's forge event that's coming up uh next year may 1st through the 4th uh, to sign up and to learn more, it, go to the, go to the mensforge.com. That's right. That's it. All right, guys. Well, Kip alluded to this and said this, that tomorrow is Thanksgiving. I hope you guys are able to enjoy family and friends and remember the beautiful blessings that we have. We do. Um, it may not always feel like it. You know, I, I know guys yeah. are going through hard times. Um, I've gone through hard times as we all have. And sometimes it's some years it's harder than others to be grateful for the things that you do have. I understand that. Um, do it anyways, because even in hardship, there's a lot to be grateful for. And I really truly believe as a pragmatic approach to life that if you can even force yourself, if you have to, to be grateful, you'll come out of those challenges quicker and better off. So yeah. that's it. Kip, I, uh, also, I guess I would say maybe to be a little bit cheesy is, is also say I'm really grateful for you. Like our friendship and this professional um, opportunities that we have to work together, the things I've learned from you, man, cannot be overstated. It's, um, it's, been, it's been great to get you to know you. And also go on hunts with you now. And like this is, yeah. this is cool, man. And uh, you're a big part of this movement and what we do. And I love you like a brother. And uh, I'm grateful for you. Thank you, sir. All right, you guys, that's it. We'll be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.